Mark chapter one, 4, verse number 1. And when you find that, let's all stand in honor of the Word of God. Mark chapter 4, verse number 1. Amen. Mark 4, verse number 1. And we're going to begin. Ready? And the Bible says, And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Father, again for the, op for the opportunity to be in the house of God. Ask Holy Spirit that you would please use me tonight. Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. I ask that you would help us all, Lord, to pay attention, Lord, that we would uh, give an ear to the Word of God. Lord, as it said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. May everybody that, Lord, hear, uh, uh, Lord, that's here tonight in the service, may they hear the Word of God preached. And, Lord, may you help us to learn from it. May we be better Christians because of it. Lord, if anybody's here tonight that doesn't know that if they died, they'd go to heaven, they don't know 100% sure that they'd be with you, Lord, when they die, that Holy Spirit, they would get that settled before the evening's out. Lord, pray for the Christians, Lord, that I can add another, another brick into the wall of faith today. And just ask that, Lord, you'd help us, Lord, in the uh, message. Bless, oh, Lord, all that we do and say for your honor and your glory. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. In our text here, Mark chapter 4 is a very familiar passage of Scripture as well. Uh, talking about a parable that Jesus gives, the, sow, uh, the sower... Uh, a parable of the sower and the seed. Uh, he, uh, Jesus is addressing, if, as you see there, he began to teach by the seaside. He was to teaching to a great multitude. And he wanted to give, and Jesus often taught in parables, and then he would often explain himself, some, most of the time to the disciples. But in the parables, he would give little bits and pieces of doctrine, and he would uh, use, a heaven, uh, use an earthly uh, idea to explain a, a heavenly meaning. Um, he would use an earthly concept to help grasp uh, the doctrine that he was trying to teach. And so in this portion of Scripture, we, we see the sower, uh, the sower and the seed, very common. But the word sow, I'd like to start out, literally means to scatter. When the sower began to sow, it literally meant he would scatter the seed. If you're familiar uh, with uh, back in the Bible days, obviously they didn't have the John Deere's that we have and they didn't have the... Uh, you know the fancy equipment that we would that we would use today. So when a sower would go out to sow a field, he would just have a simple makeshift sack that he would wear over his shoulder with a pocket full of seed. And I would thought about trying to make something, and uh, but I I didn't have anything like that. So I'm just going to carry my candy bag like this. So here we go. This is normally ooh Snickers dropping everywhere. So he would just carry the seed in the kind of over his shoulder, that you know, and just to help with the weight. And then he would take the seed and just just scatter it. He would just take it and scatter it out into the field. They've plowed. He would have plowed the field already. He would have taken care of the ground. And then after he's ready to start sowing, he would and literally sowing just means to scatter. He would just take it and throw it out there. Throw some seed there and throw some seed there and throw some seed there and try to cover that field as best that he could. And Jesus gives a parable to understand that as a sower would just scatter the seed, it would go into all types of ground. We see a couple of times, you, you see there in verse number 4, it says, it came, it came to pass that some fell by the wayside. The wayside is normally uh, where they would travel. If you notice on fields, a lot of times fields are cut you know, a certain way. Well, in the, uh, in the back here in the 
in the days of the Bible that we're talking about, they would walk along the sides of the field. Those would be the waysides. They would cast the, the seeds, and some of the seeds sometimes would get over onto that. And as it would do that, the fowls of the air, as you notice, it says the birds, the fowls of the air, they would come and they would devour those up. They would take those seeds. So the sower would be out there scattering the seeds, sowing, and some would fall off by the wayside as he's nearing the edge of the field and the birds would come and take those and, and devour them. Then he would sow a little more and some would fall on stony ground. Maybe, uh, uh, maybe there's a spot where he forgot to remove some rocks, uh, maybe plowing, and most of the time they would try to clear the field of all the stones and the rocks as much as they could, but it fell upon stony ground, it says. And stony ground does not allow for much to grow. Something can grow, but it can't grow very deep. Stones, uh, stony ground does not allow for, uh, for a plant to be able to take root. And so some fell upon the stony ground. As you see there, it says where it had not much earth. Immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And then some of the seed, when the sower was sowing, some of the seed fell among thorns. In a field, they would often try to clear out as much as they can of the weeds and the thorns. But sometimes thorns would still begin to grow. And so he would throw it out maybe to this side of the field and there would be some thorns that were growing and the thorns would grow up. And as you see what it says here, that they would choke the, the, uh, the plant and it would not yield fruit. And then, of course, other fell on good ground. So we have four types of ground that we notice. You have the wayside. You have the stony ground. You have the thorny ground. And you have the good ground. This ground is a parable in the Bible. This refers to the type of hearts that the gospel is given to. The seed, of course, is the Word of God. The sower is sowing the Word of God. The Word of God falls on the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. And God says there are four types of hearts that the Word of God comes to. Those that, by, those that are by the wayside are those that don't get saved because the Word of God never took root. The seed was sown in their life, but all that it did was merely fall upon the, their heart, but it never took root. And the, and the devil takes, this, takes the Word before it takes root in their life. Some is the stony ground. The stony ground are people that are saved. There's not much earth, but they're saved. It immediately springs up, which means it doesn't take time to develop good roots. If you notice there, the stony ground uh, there in verse uh, 5, it says, And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. So it, there's not a whole lot for the plant to grow down, so immediately the plant grows up. It says immediately, as soon as it could, it sprang up. But the problem is, is a plant that develops in the stony ground does not take time to develop a good root system, therefore it dies quickly. See there, but when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some Christians, are, some Christians' hearts are like this stony ground where the Word of God is given, and it immediately does produce fruit, or immediately springs up, excuse me, but it never produces fruit because as soon as the sun comes up or as soon as persecution and trials come, it withers away. Then some fell among thorns. Thorny grounds, as you see there, verse number 7, the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Some hearts have the thorns of this life in them, and they allow the thorns to take over their life without keeping the thorns of this world in check, and it allows to choke the plant and never yields fruit. And then there are some, amen, that are on good ground, that the hearts are prepared and ready, and they get saved, amen, and they produce fruit. Now, the stony ground, the thorny ground, and good ground are all types of saved individuals. The only, uh, the only ground in this parable that does not take and receive uh, the, the seed of the Word of God is the wayside. Those are lost people. The rest, the stony, the thorny, and the good ground, all refer to different types of Christians. Now we go to verse 11. 
And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, in Mark chapter 4. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. So we see the sower sows the word of God. And then he explains, These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Notice for the, thorny, for the stony ground, they endure for a little time. There are Christians that they come to church for a, uh, for a time. They endure for a little time, but afterward when affliction and persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. That's a sad type of Christianity to live, where when you receive the word of God, you get saved, you're born again, but you only stick around while things are doing good, while everything is going great. But as soon as difficulty comes, you leave. As soon as persecution arises, you skip out on God. What this means is that they truly did not love the Word. Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Those on stony ground get offended easily. We have to keep our lives in check that we make sure that we are not uh, easily offended. That when persecutions and afflictions arise because of the Word of God, that we don't just skip out, of, skip out on God because we don't want to have to endure affliction. What's the Bible saying? All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Amen. We need to be dedicated to the Lord. Not allow our hearts to become stony where we uh, just leave as soon as... And look, it says, uh, verse 17, uh, it says, when, arise, uh, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So it doesn't take long. Immediately they're offended. Immediately the word springs up in their life and, and, and allows for a plant to grow, but then it's immediately they're also offended. Amen. Don't be one of those kinds of Christians that you're offended quickly. Amen. Don't be a, a shallow Christianity, so to speak, where you, uh, your, your Christianity only goes so far. And then we have the thorny ground again. These are those that hear the word. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But these are the ones that get saved, and look at what it, what it talks about, the thorns. It says, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So these types of Christians are those that are saved, they're born again, they're excited, but what happens is the cares of the world begin to creep in. They really love the world instead of loving God. Their affection is toward the fashion of the world, the agenda of the world, instead of an almighty God. What else creeps in? The deceitfulness of riches. They're deceived by Hollywood to think that riches and wealth and riotous, riotous, riotous living, that maybe it's really worth it. And they allow deceitfulness of money and wealth to choke the word of God in their life and become unfruitful. Man, don't let Hollywood confuse you. Don't let Hollywood make you think that there's something that they have that you don't. Because, brother, Hollywood is a deceiver. And they'll deceive you into thinking that it's all worth it what they have, but there's really no profit. Hollywood likes to make it look good. And a lot of Christians fall into the trap of the deceitfulness of riches where they think, if I just had more money, life would be better. If I just had more things, life would be better. If I just had more, and you, put in the, and you fill in the blank. My friend, it's not riches and wealth and possessions that make happiness. Amen. True joy 
comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. But deceitfulness of riches chokes the word. Also, lusts of other things entering in. I believe the Bible says the lusts of other things because there are so many things in this world that you can lust after. So many things that you can allow yourself to begin to desire more than you desire God, and it'll choke the Word of God. Our affections ought to be on things above, not on things on the earth. We have to be careful because so quickly we can begin to lust, we can begin to desire, we can begin to want to do other things other than serve the Lord. Amen. Watch what happens, though. And it says, and it becometh unfruitful. When you allow the cares of this world, and you allow the deceitfulness of riches, and you allow the lusts of other things to enter into your life, it will choke the Word of God, and you'll become an unfruitful Christian. You mark it down. You get out of church. You leave the house of God. You leave the Word of God. You leave everything that has to do with God, and I promise you, you'll become unfruitful in everything. Amen. You'll become unsatisfied. You'll become unhappy with your life. And then we have the good ground. That's not... I'm going to change gears... I said all that to say this, we as Christians here, I believe everybody here loves the Lord and we want to serve God. God places all of us into these categories. I pray that everyone here is the good kind of ground that you desire to produce fruit for an almighty God. But we're all commanded, we're all commanded to be sowers. You notice the, Jesus never says who the sower is. He compares everything else, but he never gives the sower's identity. You know why? Because everyone is to be a sower. You fill in the blank, your name in that spot of the sower. God wants you to sow the seed. And in sowing the seed, you will meet these kinds of people. You will meet people that won't hear the word of God. You'll meet people that will... They will, like the wayside, they won't get saved. They won't trust God. They won't have anything to do with God. You'll meet people that will get saved, but it will be stony ground where they don't last a long time. They're here and then they're gone. You'll meet people with thorny ground that get choked by the world, and then you'll, you'll have those that will be good ground, that will produce fruit. But God doesn't say we... But God says that we're to sow, and we don't always know when we're sowing, what kind of ground we're going to find. Men, every individual is different. When you go out and you sow the Word of God, you don't always know what that person's ground is like. You don't know what that person's ground is like. And the ground is a picture of their heart. You don't know what their heart is like. You don't know if they'll take it or if they'll reject it. But God says our job is just to sow. And I'd like to give us some pointers what is the science to successful sowing? The science to successful sowing. Every one of us here, if you're born again, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, God has given you a command to sow the Word of God. God has given you a command to reach the world with the gospel. Well, how can we do it and be successful? Well, I believe there's a few things that we have to understand, a few things that we need to uh, pin down in our lives to make us successful at sowing. Number one, you must have a burden or you must have a desire to sow. You must have a desire to sow. Psalms 126 verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. A sower does not go forth to sow unless he has a desire to bring forth fruit. Do you have a burden? Do you have a desire to reach the lost? Do you care tonight if others spend eternity in hell? You see, a sower does not go to a field to sow seed for no reason. He goes with the intention in mind to bring forth fruit. 
And in our lives, we don't just go into this old world for no reason. We go and we go give the gospel. We go soul winning. Why? Because we want people to get saved. But you have to have a desire. Do you have a desire to see people saved? Do you desire for people to come to a knowledge of the truth? Or does it not phase you that a world is lost and dying and going to hell? Does it not phase you that there's children that every day die and spend eternity in hell because nobody cares for their soul? Does it not phase you that in Wichita, a town of, uh, of 380,000 plus, that every three seconds they say somebody dies? You can count it. Every three seconds, somebody in this world dies. That somebody might be in Wichita, Kansas. They spend eternity in hell because we don't have a desire to sow the seed. Romans 10, 10 15, God says, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. God wants us to have a desire to sow. You've got to have a desire. You've got to develop a burden to reach the lost. Amen. Somebody gave you the gospel. Think about it. If somebody hadn't given you the gospel, if somebody hadn't been faithful, if somebody hadn't given you an opportunity, you'd spend eternity in hell tonight. But somebody cared enough to preach the gospel to you. Now God says, you take it to somebody else. Don't just be satisfied with your personal salvation. Have a desire to reach people. Amen. Maybe we can't reach the world, but we can reach our neighbors. We can reach our co-workers. We can reach those that are around us at the grocery store. You can reach those that maybe you have a personal connect with, but every one of them, you've got to have a desire to see them produce for the Lord. That's what brings successful sowing in a sower. Sure, you could get out there and be, and do like the rest and just pass out tracks, but unless you have a desire, you won't stick with it. You can get out there like the rest and just because maybe we have a time and you go and pass out tracks like everybody else just to mark off your spiritual duties, but unless you have that burning desire and a burden for the lost, you'll never stick. Amen. There must be a burden. Oh, how do you, how do you give, how do, how do we get to understand for Christians in America that there's a world lost and dying going to hell? You say, what are you talking about, Brother Rich? I'm talking about when every person dies, they have a soul. And that soul will spend eternity in hell or spend eternity with Jesus. And if they go to hell, it's in Wichita, Kansas, it's our fault if we don't do our part to sow the seed. Wichita is our field. Do you have a burden to sow the seed in Wichita? Amen. Number two, not only must you have a burden, or I mean you must have a desire, but you must depart to the field. You must have a desire to sow, but you must depart to the field. The Bible says there went out a sower to sow. That means he didn't just stay at home. That means he didn't just watch the TV. That means he didn't just enjoy leisure time. That means he got out, he got ready, and he went out to the field to sow the seed. You must go out. Amen. We must go out into the highways and hedges and sow the seed of God's Word to every creature. Amen. When you're in line at the grocery store, take a track and sow the seed. When you're in the drive through sow the seed. Everywhere you go, when you go out into the field, prepare to sow the seed. Amen. God can only use those that go out to the field. Amen. A sower can't sow seed in his backyard. He's got to go to the field. A sower can't sow seed in his house. He's got to go to the field. A sower can't sow seed in a building and anywhere else. He's got to go to the, where the people are. Amen. Lots of times there's lots of 
preachers that will say, well, they'll come to church if they want it. My friend, can I tell you that some can't come to church? Look at the thief on the cross. He never made it to church, but Jesus sowed the seed. Look at the Ethiopian eunuch. He never did go to a church, but Philip sowed the seed. And there, was, and there was fruit that produced. We must go out. And every time we go out, we must be in a mind to sow the seed. Number three, you must, you must uh, and I'm doing D's here, so you must disseminate the seed. The word disseminate means to sow. But what I'm talking about is you must sow the seed. The seed is God's word. Amen. Without the Word of God, you can't be a successful sower. God says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You have to sow the Word of God. When you go out, you can't just invite somebody to church. You've got to give them the Word of God. Amen. You can't just say, well, we have a great kids program. We have to get them the, words of, the Word of God. Amen. To produce fruit for people to be saved, there must be the Word of God. Isaiah 28, 24 says, Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? In other words, why should we just plow the field to not sow the seed? When you develop a relationship with somebody, when you develop a friendship with somebody, with people that you're around, with neighbors, with co-workers, you're helping to plow and prepare the field. Don't do all of that work. Don't plow the field and then not sow the seed. How many people that we have that are friends? How many family members do we have that God's given to us? How many people do we make a connect with that we help to prepare the field? but we never sow the seed. Can you think in your mind, do you have lost family members? Well, for them to be saved, you've got to sow the seed. Do you have a lost friend? Maybe somebody you grew up with. Maybe somebody from high school. Maybe somebody that you've known all your life that maybe they just lived down the road. Maybe it's a neighbor. Have you ever given them the gospel? Well, for there to be salvation, that you have to sow the seed. If you're going to be a successful soul winner, if you're going to be a successful sower, listen, you not only have to have a burden, you, can't, you have to go out to the field, but you've got to sow the seed. Take the Word of God with you. Be bold and give the gospel. We can't, have a, we can't be a secret service Christian where we never give the gospel because we're scared of what people think. We must constantly be ready to give the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many around us that walk by us every day. They see that we're different. They know that we're different. Our tastes are different. Our desires are different. But they'll never be saved until we sow the seed. Amen. God says, don't do all that work of plowing the field and then never sow the seed. Also, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. It says, he that observeth the wind shall not sow. And he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. In other words, if you just stand around and observe everything else going on, but you never sow the seed, you'll never have, you'll never produce fruit. If we as a church just stand around and we just observe, we never go out and go soul winning. We never give, give out the gospel tracts. We never take time to care about somebody's soul if all we do is just meet Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, but we never sow the seed. We'll never produce fruit. You have to sow that seed. If you just regard the clouds when it's time to reap, if you just look up and say, well, we can't do it today, it looks like it might rain, then we'll never reap. Well, we can't go this week. We've got a basketball game. Well, I can't give him a track. He, he looks, he looks uh, for my wife sometimes, she'll be like, he looks scary. Amen. You've got to sow the seed. You can't stand around 
and just observe as people walk by. Take the initiative and get out and give them the gospel. Amen. Number four, to be a successful sower, you must disperse the seed. Amen. Disperse me. We're talking about scattering. Amen. That means you don't pick and choose who you give the gospel to. That means we believe that Jesus died for everyone. Red, yellow, black, or white, they are precious in His sight. We must be willing to sow to anybody, anywhere. Our church believes that no matter who walks through the back doors of that church, amen, of this church, that they can be saved. They can get the gospel. We have to be willing to sow the seed. We have to be willing to scatter it out. doesn't matter what ground that it falls upon. Amen. We can't be afraid to give the gospel because somebody will get saved. There shouldn't be a single person that you're not willing to give the gospel to. If there's any, is there anybody in your mind that you'd say, Lord, I'd have a hard time giving them the gospel? Start praying now. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Start praying now. Begin to weep and beg God for that desire, for that burden, and beg God to give you the boldness to give that seed to anybody and everybody. That means we have to sow the seed to children. We have to sow the seed to the ladies, to the men, to the teenagers, to the people in the jails, to the people that just, to the homeless, to those that are walking down the street, to those in their grocery store, to everybody around us that breathes. We must be willing to sow the seed. I love the story of, a, of that young boy walking down the side of the beach. And a man sees, sees him as he's walking down. He takes a starfish and he just throws it into the sea. And he picks another one up and he throws it into the sea. And there's hundreds of them, just hundreds all along the beach. He takes another starfish and throws it. Takes another starfish and throws it. The man walks up and says, son, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm saving these starfish. They got washed up on the shore, he said. I'm going to save them. He said, son, you'll never be able to get them all. He said, look how many of them are. He said, there's hundreds of them. He said, you might as well just quit. He said, you'll never be able to rescue them all. He said, no, but... I can save that one. He said, and I can save that one. And I can save that one. Amen. We may not be able to reach the world, but we can reach our neighbors. We may not be able to reach all those in Wichita, but we can go one door at a time and give the gospel. We must be willing to give it to anybody. We must be willing to go to the ghetto. We must be willing to go to the millionaire's house. We must be willing to go to the business. We must be willing to go to anybody, anywhere to disperse the seed. Amen. Then number five, the key to successful sowing, you must not desist to sow. Desist means to stop or to cease. We must not stop sowing the word. You must be consistent. Sowing takes work. It takes patience. It takes patience. You must keep going and going and going. You must sow every day, every week, every month, every year. You have to consistently be scattering the seed out there. Be consistently giving out God's Word. Be consistently handing out those tracts because you never know when someone will turn out. You'll never know when someone will get saved. You'll never know when somebody may come and they hear the gospel and get saved and become a preacher. You never know who you're giving that gospel to, but you must consistently sow. You'll never be successful if you don't keep trying. Amen. The first couple times, the door may be slammed in your face. The first couple times, they may reject They may reject the gospel track. They may not want to listen. They may not want to hear. But you have to develop that desire, that burden that says, they may not hear me, but the next one might. 900,000 people in in this area. I promise you somebody wants to hear the gospel. If we labor year after year just to give one person, just to see one person escape hell, then it's worth it. Think about it. How much is hell worth? How much is heaven worth? Are you willing to stop so soon? 
Are you willing to give up so soon than to save somebody from eternity in a lake of fire? The problem with Christians is we get discouraged. We stop too soon. We stop carrying gospel tracts. We stop giving the gospel to those around us. We stop caring because we say it's not worth it. They, nobody listens. I promise you somebody will. Somebody will stop. Somebody will hear you. Somebody will want to hear the gospel. Somebody wants to know about heaven. Somebody wants to know how that there's a way out, that there's joy in this world. There's happiness and peace in Jesus Christ. They've looked all over. They want to hear about Jesus. But we can't stop short. We stop too soon. We let the cares of this world grow up and choke us. And we don't produce that fruit. We let things get to our mind. We become distracted. And we begin to stop sowing. Lots of things hinder a Christian from going to sow. What is it in your life? What stops you from giving out that gospel track? What stops you from telling your neighbor? What stops you from telling somebody about Jesus? Don't stop. Amen. God needs sowers. I gave you five things that will help you to be successful in sowing. Number one, you've got to have a desire. Get a desire. Pray. Ask God to help you develop a desire to reach the lost. Number two, you must depart to the field. You've got to go out. Amen. When a chance, maybe if we can, if you say, you know, I, I'd like to go soul winning. Amen. I'll go with you. But we've got to go to the field. I, go, I went yesterday with my, me and my wife and I knocked some doors because I want to go to the field to sow the seed. Number three, you've got to disseminate. Or in other words, you've got to sow the seed. You've got to use God's word. Amen. Don't be afraid to sow that seed everywhere you go. Then you must disperse the seed. Amen. You've got to scatter it. Give it to everybody. Doesn't matter who it is. Then you must not desist to sow. You must not stop. You must not cease. You've got to keep going. God needs sowers. Matthew chapter 9 verse 38 says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. My prayer is that we'll have a burden and that God will give us a burden to be laborers in his harvest. This verse, Matthew 9, 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I believe there's many in Wichita, Kansas, that want to hear the gospel. I believe there's many all over the world. But there's just very few laborers. There's very few people that actually will give the gospel. There's very few Christians that actually will give the gospel to somebody. Very few Christians that even know how to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. God says the harvest really is plenteous. There's not a lack of people that want to get saved. There's just a lack of laborers in the harvest. Will you volunteer? John 4, 35 says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already. To harvest. Lots of times we put it off and say, well, not yet. We'll go later when people are ready. My friend, people are ready today to hear the gospel. The moment you walk out those back doors and you see, and you see Wichita, you see your field, and I promise you people are ready then to hear the gospel. We don't have to wait till until next Saturday or, or, or the next time maybe we have a soul winning time. You can give the gospel today and I promise you people are ready. But like I said, there's not a lack of harvest. There's not a lack of people that want to be saved. There's just lack, a lack of laborers. The question is, will you labor with me to preach the gospel? Will you get a desire and a burden to reach Wichita, Kansas? People are dying and going to hell every day. Do we care? Do you care? Do you care about your coworkers? Do you care about your mom? 
Do you care about your dad? Do you care about your brother? Do you care about your sister? Do you care about the grocery attendant? Do you care about the person at the drive-thru that hands it, that hands the, uh, that hands you the food out the window? Do you care about those walking down the road that you don't know where they're going or who they are or what troubles that they face? You may never see them again. Do you care? The Holy Spirit will tell you. The Holy Spirit will tell you you need to give them the gospel. The Holy Spirit will prick your heart if you'll listen, and He'll tell you who's ready for the harvest. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Are you willing to labor? Are you willing to sow? Are you willing to bring forth fruit? Too many times I believe that we have an opportunity to give the gospel. I know it's true in my life. I have an opportunity to sow the seed, but I, all, I don't always do it. God says, be ready. Sow the seed, because the fields are white, all ready to harvest. When you go out, you must look at people through the eyes of God. Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the multitude. Jesus cared so much because he knew who was going to die and spend eternity in hell. We may not know like Jesus did. We may not be able to see the souls of man, but we can have a burden for their soul. Every child, every adult, every person, we must give the gospel to. Amen. I want to be a sower for the Lord Jesus Christ. Wichita, Kansas needs Amazing Grace Baptist Church to sow the seed of God's Word. There are, and I, and I should look it up, there are hundreds of churches in this town. Hundreds of churches. How many of them actually sow the seed? They all have programs. They all have their youth nights. They all have their entertainment centers. But how many of them are sowing the seed of God's Word? You know why? Because they don't care. They care about the outside. They care about the numbers. They care about the money. But there's not a true desire and care for the lost soul that dwells inside that person. God forbid that at our church we ever get to a place where somebody could walk through those doors, a stranger, and we not even once think, where will they spend eternity? God forbid that our hearts be so hard that we not have a, that we not walk down the road and desire to just share the gospel, give a track. Because you don't know if you'd ever meet that person again. There's hungry people. There's hurting people. They need the gospel today. I don't know I don't know their heart. They may not receive the gospel. But God doesn't command us God doesn't command us to go if we want to. God commands us to go because it's the right thing to do. God just says, "Go into all the world and preach the gospel." Amen. You may not know what will happen. You may not know if they'll receive it. But you can count on this. Somebody will, I promise you. Somebody will receive the word of God. Verse 20 says, And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit. And he said unto them, verse 21, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? You're a light for this world. Are you taking your light and hiding it under a bushel? Are you hiding your light under a bed? Or are you putting your light out there for the world to see, to lead them to Jesus Christ? Amen. There's a lost world. People want to hear the gospel. Listen to me. People want to know that Jesus died for them. You may sit here today and think, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on an old rugged cross and gave his life so that you could have eternity in heaven. But he didn't just die for you. The Bible says he died for the world. 
It's selfish to think that Jesus only died for you, and it's selfish to be saved and never give the gospel. Jesus died for everyone. Let us not be selfish Christians. Let us not be a selfish church that we don't have a desire to lead others to Jesus Christ. Boy, it's easy to get distracted from sowing. Let's not get distracted. Let's have, let's have fun. Let's enjoy fellowship. Let's enjoy time together. But let's not get distracted from the field. Amen. Too many times, I believe, in churches, we get distracted from the field and we never reap the harvest. Amen. There's a harvest to be reaped. Amen. We have to get out there to the field. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do.